Hey, y'all. Welcome. Thanks for joining us. We just are um, solving through some technical difficulties real quick. We're trying to find Lewis L. Reed. He's in the building. We'd like to add him as a panelist and then we can get going. Still do not see Lewis. Give us one second. Thanks for your patience, y'all. Thank you all again so much for joining us. I see a good number of people here, um, which is which is amazing. And we're just having a little bit of technical technical difficulties trying to find Lewis L. Reed, who uh, should be getting us rolling here in just a minute. Hello. Hello, Mr. Reed. Thank you so much for joining us. Can you can you hear me? Uh, I got a call. I got a call in my ears. We're Hey, can you guys hear me? Yes, we can hear you and we are live, Lewis. So we got sure. a good number of people here waiting for you to get us started, please, sir. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much to everyone uh, with your patience and also uh, for, for being patient with me. Uh, hello. Thank you for everyone for joining. Without further ado, we want to give, um, we want to just jump right into our run of show. Uh, uh, today. My name is Louis L. Reed. I am the newly appointed senior advisor to our executive leadership team here at the Reform Alliance. Uh, and as you all know, we recently launched our community grant initiative starting with Pennsylvania. Uh, at a high level, at a high level um, uh, perspective, I want to talk to you just a little bit about what this investment means into direct for direct service providers. In essence, Reform Alliance 
our our origin story predicated in the city of Philadelphia. Obviously, as you know, Meek Mill having been disproportionately impacted by a technical violation that in effect, not just moved the city of Philadelphia, but it, it quite frankly, it moved the entire nation to want to take action, not just to get um, rally behind Meek uh, in his situation, but it also brought together people that form the Reform Alliance that included Meek Mill, that included Michael Rubin, that included Jay-Z, that included Black billionaire Robert F. Smith, Van Jones, and a few other people. And in recent years, we have heard from you. We are responding to the call that you have with and about Reform Alliance as it relates to how we are going to support you in the community. And so today's call is to in effect, talk about uh, some of those things. We want to make sure that you know that we are not just invested in the state of Pennsylvania at large, but we are specifically invested in the community of Philadelphia. And we wanna make sure that you know that that investment is here uh, in, a, in, a, in effect with unrestricted uh, uh, funding, so to speak. And so we are going to walk you through what we are looking for in an application and of course, answer some of the questions that you may have. I want to introduce you to my colleague, someone that I've been knowing for quite some uh, a period of time. We've worked on a number of legislative uh, priorities over the years, and his name is Britton Smith. Britton is the newly appointed Senior Director of Memberships and Organizing for Reform Alliance, and he's going to tell you a little bit about reform, our approach as an, orga as an organization, and how we are going to stay connected to the field. Without further ado, let me toss it over to Britton. Appreciate it, Lewis. Thank you so much. Um, and, and again, it is indeed a, a, a pleasure to be with you all just so that we can uh, introduce this uh, wonderful initiative that we have. Um, and for many of you all, this may not be your first interaction with reform. Uh, for some of the groups, uh, this is. And so I just want to give a quick overview of who we are, our mission, um, and, and our engagement approach. Um, reform Alliance, uh, aims to transform probation, as you can see on the screen, uh, by changing the laws, but more importantly, by changing the culture around uh, creating real pathways to, to, to work and well-being. Uh, and this is very significant because it's a, a very unique approach that involves and engages our communities in ways that they haven't been before in the legislative process. We know that uh, by changing the hearts and minds, we have a better opportunity at realizing those changes that come through the legislation. Um, of course, uh, oftentimes we see the legislation uh, written uh, without individuals directly in mind. So again, as we work to create a culture and influence these systems, uh, we definitely know that it's gonna be reliant on the work a lot of our community partners are doing. With that, our approach uh, to engaging, uh, if we go back to the last slide, if uh, with that, we know our approach uh, is going to be to engage uh, our coalition, build and, uh, and engage our coalitions, uh, engage the private sector, uh, and support the work that our grassroots group uh, are doing uh, in the field, because this is, this is significant, because again, these are the first lines of defense and the first resources, uh, and to, to quote my, my, my good brother Lewis, as he always says, uh, the people closest to the problem, often closest to the solution, just further away from the resources. So we want to make sure that we are engaging those groups that are the first line of defense uh, for uh, our communities that really need this change. So with that, next slide, please. With that, we want to just talk about what our community grant uh, initiative and grant program really is. And this program is really based around staying connected with and creating the relationships uh, with organizations on the ground and supporting programming uh, that supports systems impacted individuals. For example, um, just to give you an example of our, our, our funding priorities, uh, as you can see on the screen, uh, the education, which is for the job training, job placement, uh, public safety, uh, providing programming that leads to safer communities, civic engagement, uh, the, the restoration of rights programs, health and wellness programs, um, so many different initiatives that our community groups are engaging in unique ways uh, with our systems impacted individuals. 
uh, you all are the experts and, and know what programming works best to support your communities. So our job is not necessarily to tell you what uh, limitations or what restrictions necessarily fall under those programs, because again, we know these services are necessary and are needed um, for our communities. And so we want to support as many groups as we can. And most groups uh, will get a grant in the range of $5,000 to $10,000. Uh, but basically no grant would no grant award would exceed uh, fifty thousand dollars. So uh, this this allows us to maximize the engagement we can with as, as, as many groups as possible. Uh, also keeping in mind that if you don't receive a grant during this iteration, please know that the initiative is ongoing and it's a rolling process so that we will be revising uh, or revisiting sorry uh, applications for future awards. And so uh, to go a little further in depth with that, uh, I want to introduce uh, Trulisha Corbett, who is our Deputy Director of Membership and Organizing, who will talk you through the application process, uh, and then we'll hold a, a brief Q&A. Trulisha. Thank you, Britton. Hello, everyone. Um, as you all are probably wondering who is eligible for this grant, so you must be a community-based organization with a 501c3 status and currently registered and in good standing. You must also provide services and or programming in the Commonwealth, as well as being located principally in the Commonwealth. And you must also show that you have a demonstrated commitment to empowering people directly impacted by the justice system. The most important part to note here is that organizations must meet all requirements to be deemed eligible. All applications must be submitted through the Google form that is linked in the RFP. Applications submitted via email will not be accepted. The application includes an online form that must be completed, which we will go through later in this session. You are also re required to provide certain documentation that will support your application. Um, those required documents are as followed, a 501c3 letter, which you must submit, um, which is a letter organizations receive from the IRS, which shows they have that tax exempt status, a complete budget template. Um, the template is provided by reform and is linked in the application when you're filling it out. And we will also go over that later in this session. And then as well as your 990 form for the past three years. Um, and these are just some, some tips and things to remember as you are filling out this application, um, you must answer all required questions. Um, some narrative sections do have word limits and to be deemed a complete application, all sections must be 100% completed and required documentation attached. So I will share my screen for a moment and I will walk you guys through that application process. All right, so this is our um, press release uh, where you can learn more about the grant program, um, our funding priorities, etc. cetera. Um, this also contains the link to our actual application. And when you click on that, this Pennsylvania Community Grant Application-2022 uh, will pop up. And I've gone ahead and kind of pre-filled this out in anticipation of going over this with you guys. So in section one, this is where we really capture your contact information and admin information. Um, you'll be required to provide your email, um, a question, do you serve justice impacted individuals? We'll have to as well input your organization's name, your tax ID number, and then upload that 501c3 confirmation letter that I mentioned earlier. You will also be required to uh, put a point of contacts, first and last name, their position within the organization, and then an email and phone number for them as well. You'll be also required to provide your uh, organization's location, um, and then a brief summary uh, date and state where the organization was founded, a brief history, um, and a mission statement of your organization's purpose, 
and also as well any links to social media websites and or pages that you guys may have. Once you get through section one, you click through next. And then you proceed to the section two. And in section two, in this line, you would put the funding amount requested. You would then go through the budget template which we will go through in the next slide. Um, you will provide a brief summary of your project, which is no more than 400 characters. And in this summary, um, you wanna make sure that you include key activities, population, your project's purposes, goals, deliverables, and proposed number of individuals to be served. And then you would list any legislative connections, any community relationships um, that would be relevant to this alliance with reform. And then to complete this, you would upload your 990 form from the past three years. If we go back to our next slide, which is the budget template, and I will walk through this uh, line by line with everyone so that they have a, a clear understanding of how to fill this template out. Um, our team put this together for organizations uh, to be able to use to outline their budget for the amount of funds they requested. Um, so we'll start uh, at the top. So where you see uh, for gross salaries and wages, we really want you to annotate the total amount of wages and not uh, individual staff. So if you wanted to put the total amount for your, you would put the total amount for your executive or managerial team in the executive compensation allocated line. And then for, you would do the same for staff compensation. And that would be like your community specialist and our executive assistants. And then you would see the subtotal of those two combined below. Moving on to professional fees, only utilize this if it is over $500. In this example, the organization hired a social media consultant and it was $1,000. And so it is reflected in the professional uh, fee section. Um, so you literally just uh, click on this field um, and then you insert the, the type of professional fee. And then you go to the right and put the amount and then in the professional fee subtotal, you should see the, the total there. Going into travel expenses, um, where you can note any travel expense here. And for example, an expense would be uh, commuting in between Philadelphia and Harrisburg for a community event or a lobby day. Another example could be flights that are relevant to your work. For this particular um, template that we pre-filled out, uh, they had a lobby day in Harrisburg, it was $150, and that was annotated in travel expenses. For overhead expenses, um, for office supplies, um, we have some examples in our template. So that would be things like supplies, workbooks, food, et cetera. For IT support slash hardware, um, if you bought a Zoom license, you would annotate that in that section. And then for rent, you would annotate the monthly rent. And then for other, um, and this is where we would really like for you guys to capture your programming. So in this template, you see some examples uh, such as the community cookout, job fair, et cetera. And then the next line below is the overhead expenses total. Um, and then at the bottom would be the total grant expense. Next slide. All right, here's an overview um, of our timeline. March 29th is the last day that applications will be accepted. Um, we will review and score applications from April 4th to April 8th, and we will notify organizations no later than April 11th if their application was successful. And with that, I will turn it over to Alex to host our Q&A. Um, thank you, Trilisha. The first question in the Q&A comes from me which is how did you get your face to show up over that thing like that? I've never seen that before. Um, so props to you for the technical ingenuity. Um, 
Okay. First question is, um, is from Diane and she's asking, is funding solely available to organizations in Philadelphia or, or are we going across the state? She's in Lehigh Valley. I can answer that question, uh, Alex. Please. Uh, th and thank you so much for the question. Yes, this, the funding is available throughout the state of Pennsylvania. Um, as introduced, we wanted to put an emphasis in the city of Philadelphia, especially considering that our origin story began uh, in the streets of Philadelphia, but the grant opportunity in and of itself is open to all four corners of the great state of Pennsylvania without question. Thank you. Um, next question is uh, one that I received elsewhere, not in the chat, but um, question is if I don't have, if I'm in the process of getting my own 501c3, but I currently operate under a fiscal sponsorship, am I, am I eligible? Yeah, that's without question. I can answer that as well. Uh, that's without question. Uh, so long as that you can show proof uh, and verification of having a fiscal sponsor, uh, we'll definitely uh, take a look at that on an individual case by case basis and make that determination uh, without question. Thank you. There's a bunch of questions in here about the number of years of tax returns. Some people might have you know, a, a new organization that just received their status. They don't have three years of returns. So Will not having those three years disqualify people from applying? Not at all. Not at all. Uh, we want to invite everyone to uh, uh, to apply first and foremost. Uh, second of all, we do recognize and understand that there are organizations in operation um, that you guys might have you know gotten an upstart during the pandemic um, because there was a need there, uh, and so. We do, real, uh, we do realize and recognize that. And so again, on a case by case basis, as the applications come in, and when there is an explanation to say, hey, our organization has only been in existence uh, since 2020, uh, and here's the work that we're doing, et cetera, we'll definitely take that into uh, consideration and we'll make a, we'll make a determination uh, accordingly. Okay, great. Thank you for that. Um, I have another question about the budget template. Is, is that for the organization's annual year or for the, the expenditures that they're applying for the grant? Uh, I'm going to defer that to Trelisha. My understanding is for the expenditures applied to the grant, but yeah. Trelisha, you want to pick that up? Yes, Willis, that is correct. Okay, great. Um, somebody's saying, are, are we sure you can upload three separate 990 files to sometimes survey monkey only lets you have one file? Uh, if you can't combine the files or if you have problems with the form, um, can somebody drop a, uh, the email in the chat? I think it's submissions at reformalliance.com. If you have any problems actually filling any of this stuff out, please hit us up and um, we'll get right back to you in terms of walking you through what might be going on and investigating on our end if it's a technical challenge. Thanks so much for that, Alex. Yep, um, I've got Zane with Physicians for Criminal Justice Reform. Um, they're registered in Georgia, but they work nationally and he's personally based in Pennsylvania. Would there be any leeway to consider an org in our situation? Yeah, so if organizations are a national organization, but you do have a division and or component and or you're just doing the work in Pennsylvania, uh, we wanna hear from you. And we wanna be able to, again, evaluate that on a case by case basis uh, to see if whether or not the need is conducive for uh, the, the grant application. And we'll, we'll, we'll try to figure that out. Um, um, also, also to that end, um, just for, uh, and also for further clarification, the funds for this could only be used for your Pennsylvania based projects. So if you do have, uh, if you are a national arm uh, or national organization with a, a, an arm or an apparatus in Pennsylvania, uh, the grant for this, uh, this, circuit, uh, this circle of grants will only be applied for your Pennsylvania activities. Thank you for that, Britton. Um, I got a couple questions. One asking if if we'll be able to obtain the slides that were shown, as well as a recording of this um, Q and A and in this presentation. Um, I believe the answer of that will be yes. We'd like to upload this in full and attach it to the the application page that's available on Reform's website. Um, if somebody wants to type it into the chat, it is case sensitive. It's reformalliance.com/pa-rfp, and you got to put the other dash at the end of it. So we'll have the recording and the slides available. Um, you can also access the link to the application there. 
where I know some folks are asking, can we see the budget template prior or the submission question so we can work on it? There's a link on that page where you'll be able to access um, the application and you should be able to take a look and download those templates uh, in advance. Can we submit, this is William asking, can we submit a request for part of our general operating support, i.e. part of a staff member salary or is it for a particular project? I'm not sure. I'm not certain. I understand well, that question. Well, I think I think. Let me let me let me take that one, Lewis. Um, they're asking, can it can it supplement some of their pre existing and ongoing work that they already have? Yeah. Um, uh, so, in a sense, it, it, no, you do not necessarily need to create a brand new program for this. This can help supplement some of the work and activities and 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 the day to day operation that you already have going on. Uh, and that's part of what we'll review uh, as you submit your application. Great. Um, so some questions about, does your organization have to be around longer than three years? And the answer to that is no, it does not. Um, applicants will be notified, Trulisha mentioned, on by, by April 11th or April 14th, somewhere in that window. Um, but April somewhere 11th. Yeah, April 11th will be the, the, the no later than. So you, you may actually hear earlier, um, but no later than uh, April 11th when we make our final decisions. Will executive directors, founders who have been impacted by the justice system be given priority? Question from Anid. Well, look, we, we're trying to have equal priority a, a, across the board. Um, and the, the priority in, in, in this case is the work that is being done, not necessarily the people who are in leadership. Uh, and so we're trying to give equal priority literally all across the board um, to everyone. Um, um, but we do appreciate the leadership of people who have lived experiences and people who are justice impacted. That's without question. Uh, and so there might be alignment in and around other uh, forthcoming campaigns and or initiatives that reform is going to be undertaking, um, which you'll hear me talk a little bit about in my closing. Um, but for the fact of the matter is that we're giving priority to the work, not necessarily to the person who's in leadership at the at the organization. Um, speaking of the work, we got a couple of questions about sort of the type of our, our priority buckets. So we got Douglas asking, you know, Black Men Heal is the organization name primarily deals with mental health. Can you elaborate more about that category around health and wellness and what we're looking for? Um, and then, and then Sierra is asking, you know, is it specifically for criminal justice reform, or can it be inclusive of juvenile justice, school to prison pipeline work? Yes, um, and that's a great question. Um, around the health and wellness, um, there there are so many aspects of 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 needs that need to be addressed. Uh, when, when you're talking about the specific community. So uh, whether it's the fitness, whether it's the mental health, uh, whether it's the uh, therapy sessions, whether it's uh, any aspect of that, uh, all those qualify. So I think the to the to the di direct point of Black Men Hill, that's a great example of uh, one of the needs that needs to be addressed and the type of work that we definitely look forward to um, supporting uh, as we see these applications. Um, and the other question, um, to the other point, um, again, along this scope of work, uh, we're, we're not particularly um, uh, limiting the types of projects. So from juvenile justice, school to prison pipeline, those are all works that we know are essential uh, to, to going alongside the mission of, of what some of so many of your organizations doing uh, are, are doing. So I, I also want to encourage that you all um, focus as well as uh, on the projects that are within your own wheelhouse that are aligned with your mission statements. Uh, because again, what we're looking to do is support the work that you all are doing in your respective spaces because you all are the experts and in a lot of spaces, subject matter experts. So uh, from the school to prison pipeline, juvenile justice work, uh, whether it's therapy, health and wellness, uh, as long as it fits into um, the direct work with the uh, systems impact the community, uh, I think we're, we're in alignment and we'll be happy to review all of those applications. Let, let me also add as well, um, prior to us launching this, this, this grant, 
um, opportunity for the state of Pennsylvania. We went on a listening session and we heard from you you know, we there were a lot of people who actually gave us feedback, and you talked about how restrictive funding can be. It has to be very myopic. It has to be very specific. Uh, if all of your T's are crossed and all the I's are not dotted, uh, and it doesn't necessarily fit within this this you know sliver of of whatever the very stringent requirements are, then you know the, the funding opportunity is not there. We heard that. We took that feedback, and that's hence the reason why Britain is iterating the fact that this is non-restrictive funding. So in, in essence, if you are doing work that brushes up against the criminal justice, uh, 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 the work of criminal justice reform, we want to hear from you. Uh, you, you might be, you might be doing restorative justice. Uh, you might, you know, have a theory, uh, 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 you might be helping people work through vicarious trauma and or trauma, people who have been impacted by the justice system. We wanna hear from you. We wanna be able to see those applications because your applications is actually informing us when we roll out the next iteration of what we're going to be doing on a local and or national level. Thank you for that, Lewis. Uh, 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 on a related point, I'll just answer Shakina's question. She said, what about domestic violence, sexual abuse, and sexual assault? I think the answer to that is yes. Um, certainly, if you're doing work with, with victims and survivors of, of both sexual violence and also other types of crime, we want to hear from you. I think that, that brings us to some of the other questions that have been asked, um, which is also, one, can orgs submit more than one application as long as both projects submitted tie into the grant's focus area? And then another question is, what if I'm working with a partner on this? Do we both need to submit an application? Yeah, so I'll try to answer both of those questions. Uh, we want the applications to be one organization specific. So, you know, if, if for instance, if you have two projects that you're working on and you submit an application for 25,000 here and 25,000 over there, and we grant, um, to both of those projects that's actually taken away from somebody else in the community who very well could use that extra 25,000. So um, it's our recommendation that you submit for one project in particular. I would prioritize those projects, whoever that answer that question came from, I would prior, prioritize the project that you feel is going to be of greater benefit to the community and submit uh, on there. Uh, Alex, what's the, what's the B uh, portion of that question uh, or, or, or the other question? Uh, so, I, so one question was, if I'm working with a partner, should we submit two separate applications? Like, what do they need to submit on their end? And if I have two programs, I think it's one application per org per project and just put it all in there. That's correct. What Alex said. Um, Heather's asking 400 characters doesn't seem to be a lot of words. The Google document doesn't track the count. I would, I would just say, do your best there, Heather. Um, I think that Truly, should maybe take a look at that and just make sure it's not a mistake. I think we we certainly reviewed to make sure there was adequate room to explain the work that that you all do. Um, yeah, I, I also going to say like we're we're not looking for we're not looking for a dissertation, uh, and we're also not going to be like literally counting four hundred characters. We're not. I don't know if it's four hundred characters or four hundred words. Right. I, I I believe I believe I believe what Trulisha meant is four hundred words and not necessarily four hundred characters. Um, I believe that I've made it through most of the Q&A. It's really, it's been, it's been nice to see some familiar names and a whole lot of new ones. So um, thank you all for joining. Like, like we said, if you have additional questions or encounter any challenges, technology, or otherwise filling this out, please hit us up at submissions at reformalliance.com. And again, you can find the application link in the, in the chat at reformalliance.com PA-RFP. I'll hand it back over to our panelists. Thank you so much, Alex. Look, and I appreciate everyone who's been on uh, this informational session. We want to hear from you. We want to get that feedback and we want to have you inform our process. Uh, as Britton talked about, those closest to the problem are closest to the solution, but often furthest from resources and power. And we want to close that gap. We want to shrink that gap to make sure that you who are doing the work, who have your fingers in the dirt and the grime and the muck of what's going on in your community, that you are connected to resources and power without question. Uh, I want to thank everybody for this 
uh, attending of uh, this session has been recorded, we'll follow up with an email sending you this recording, the application, and our frequently asked questions. I also want to mention as well that this is just the beginning um, for you who do submit applications. And if your application is not necessarily uh, approved and or granted during this particular round, we are going to be announcing uh, a national grant uh, as well, in addition to more uh, uh, more funding opportunities that's going to be rolling out over the course of the year. So don't get discouraged, don't be dismayed. This is just a springboard for what we want to do as we move forward. We wanna be able to stay in community with you. We wanna be able to support what you were doing in the community. And we also wanna be able to provide resources for what you were doing in the community as well. My, my uh, email address is in the chat. If somebody from my team can drop my email address in the chat. If you have any questions uh, as it relates to the work that you're doing, not specific to the grant program uh, uh, that we're offering uh, from the Reform Alliance, but if you have any questions about some of the work that you're doing, and if you want to get in closer proximity to us as Reform Alliance, please shoot me an email without compunction. With that having been said, on behalf of our CEO, Robert Rooks, on behalf of our board, uh, I text Meek uh, a little bit earlier today. He sends his regards. Uh, you know, Philadelphia is very near and dear to his heart. Uh, it's where he was bred. It's where he was raised, uh, and he wanted me to shout everybody who attended out, some of whom uh, he actually recommended be on this call today uh, with us. So we appreciate you. Thank you so much for your interest in working with us. And we look forward to reviewing your application. Uh, until next time, I'm Lewis L. Reed. Peace.